everybody good morning. morning welcome to Wednesday um, so today we're going to uh, sort of continue talking we on, on Monday we sort of established some of the um, some of our expectations regarding how files work and, and what sort of file operations our file systems are going to need to support we talked a little bit about hierarchical naming as well right it's a strategy for organizing the contents of file systems in a way that's kind of uh, useful for users and, and potentially intuitive. So today we'll, we'll start talking a little bit about specific, uh, you know, how file systems accomplish some of the design goals. We'll present the design goals again, and then we'll start looking in a little bit more detail at sort of a specific file system and what happens on disk, right? So on some level, you know, you could think of, uh, on some level, file systems are, are really a big data structure. Right? If you guys have taken courses on data structures and think about what data structures do, file systems are a, are a large data structure right? that's implemented uh, by storing information on, on disk. Right? So we'll talk a little bit about today about how that works. Um, so I'm still working on, well actually, I, I, I'm lying. I haven't started working on this yet. Uh, so that's a requirement for it to actually happen, but once I do, hopefully it will happen quickly. So, um, so yeah, I'll let you know when this happens. And yeah, any questions about, uh, oh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the anonymous student who reported that the assignment one grading script was broken because, you know, like it's, it's nice when somebody actually tells you that something's broken in a way that is giving them more points than they think they deserve. So anyway, that, that, that bug has been fixed. Um, all right, any questions about files? before we keep going. So on Monday we talked a little bit about file expectations and uh, file naming and things like this. Uh, okay, so what does a file have to do to be useful? What, what, what do we want out of this abstraction? What are some of the requirements? Because these are going to lead to some of the design goals that we look at today. Kapina, what's one thing a file needs to do in order to be useful? So yeah, we have some concept of naming, right? So I need to be able to find the file. I should, there should be a way that processes and, uh, and users of the system in particular, and the file system can agree on, on how to uh, describe uh, the name of a file, right? Which, which means that that's, the, that's how I refer to it at the file system level. What else does the file need to do? Sarah. Yeah, store data. It would be kind of sad if we just had a bunch of names that we had agreed on, but those names were kind of like, hey, I know about that name, and so do you, and that's kind of fun, right? But uh, what the names are supposed to do is refer to content, right? So reliably store date, and, and reliably store this content, right, which is a challenge on file systems, and, and be located. So those are, those are our minimum, minimum things. Um, we talked a little bit about pieces of file metadata that file... Uh, systems and users might want to, file systems might want to store because users might want to know about, right? So what's one example of a piece of file system metadata that we might want to know about? Kevin. Uh, Greg. Yeah, maybe the size of the file, that would be something that would be useful to know. That's, that's something that maybe I can calculate actually if I can find the contents of the file, but a lot of file systems might store this information so it can be easily accessed. Yeah, Josh. You can do stuff to the file? Yeah, permissions. Who's allowed to do different things to it, right? Who can read it? Who can write it? Who can append to it? You know, the, you can imagine lots of different types of, of file system permissions. Uh, what else? Spencer. Yeah, when was the file used last, right? So a lot of file systems support uh, several different types of, of timestamps associated with a file. I might care when the file was created. I might care uh, when it was last uh, written from, <laughs> written to, or read from. Uh, what else, Jeremy? About the type. Yeah, so then we started to talk about, so, th so these are things that are kind of, that I can really kind of define for any file, right? But then we started talking about potentially uh, storing file system types, right? And, and I might use that type information in a variety of ways. Um, I can use it to associate files with given applications, which is how it's normally used by, by operating systems. When you open a file on Windows or, you know, in, in any operating system, really, the operating system has to make a decision, which is what program should be used to open the file, right? You'd probably be, be disappointed if you double-clicked on your MP3 and it was open with the text editor, for example. Um, or paint or something, right? 
Um, so yeah, so uh, file system, uh, the type of file, anything else? Bethany. What else might I want to know about a file? We're getting down to the dregs here. Anybody have any, anybody have any new feature requests for file systems? Yeah, Greg. Uh, maybe if it's accessible by other files. If it's by other files what does that mean? Okay. Feature, uh, that feature request has been withdrawn. Sean. Uh, like oh, yeah, okay. That, that, that's fair. That, that might not be stored in the file itself, but we certainly need to know when we're talking about file-like objects what, what they actually are. Right? We're talking mainly about files themselves. Josh, what else? Yeah, okay, so that's, that's fair, right? We might want to know something, and actually we'll talk more about location when we start talking about specific file systems, probably Friday or next week, and particularly the, uh, one of the canonical early file systems, the Berkeley Fast File System. And, and by location, what do you mean by location? Like where to store it. Where to store it. I mean, remember, what, where, where do, when we're talking about files that are on stable storage, right? Not file-like objects that could point at other things. Where is the data in that file, right? Where, eventually that data is stored in a what? Tim? Disk. Yeah, it's some disk block, right? You know, disks have these 512-byte blocks, and any information in a file that's stored on disk is stored in some disk block, right? And on spinning disks in particular, that disk block is located on some platter, right? On some track, on some sector, there is, you know, a little piece of magnetic substrate that is storing those, those bits, right? And, and where those bits are, especially on spinning disks, actually uh, matters quite a bit. And on flash drives, locality matters as well, it turns out, just in a different way. All right, okay, these are a good, this is a good list. Um, so we talked about the fact that a lot of file systems have uh, file system calls like open and close that are used to kind of establish a relationship between between a process and a file, right? Uh, what are the, some of the things I can do by forcing processes to use open and close and kind of declare their, declare their intentions with respect to a particular file? Okay. Can you give hints about what a process is done with the file? Yeah, so I, I, I have a hint now that a process is done with the file, right? Because it called close. It could turn around and call open again immediately, right? But that, that's kind of dumb, right? Why would you do that? So. Uh, not that it doesn't happen, but, but I have some clue that the process is done using the file. What else do I potentially know? Yeah. Yeah, so I can provide, I can provide exclusive access to the file too, right, which, which certain cases I want to be able to do, right? If I just have reads and writes, it's a little bit harder to do that. I, I might be able to come up with something that would provide some kind of similar semantics, but it would be kind of weird, right? Um, and it turns out I can also improve performance potentially. Right? If I know what files are being used in what way, I can do some caching. And certain file systems also uh, will, will, in certain cases, actually try to do some predictive uh, fetching of file data. Because right? certain files are frequently read and written in certain ways. What's an example of this? What's an example of a case where I could use read ahead? What's a particular type of file that you think would be most often accessed in a very specific way. Paul. What's that? Okay. I don't know if I understand that answer. What, what kind of, well, let's try something different. Better. You said address translation. Okay, okay, so, uh, and how would that be accessed? Um, so there might be like a specific line that's open to initially when it needs to set up like the user's address or something like that. And then the user would specify that has to happen when the program is initially open. Okay, well, but what else would be true about, this is, okay, this is a good question. What else would be true about, about configuration files? When I look at patterns of access, what is more common when I look at configuration file. So, so first, oh, this is, the, this is a good exercise. So what, what, what's one thing I expect about configuration files? Bart. 
But if I looked at all your, all your configuration files and I compared them with other files on the system, what would be true about them in general? Think about the difference between a configuration file and that you know, high def movie that you have stored on your hard drive. They're small, right? In, in fact, you know, could you expect configuration files to be quite small, actually? Uh, they're text, you know, they're just storing a little bit of information. And then and what else is true about configuration files compared to, I don't know, let's say Word documents or, you know, the source code for your OS 161 tree? Yeah, Beth. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more about like, something that the file system would be able to observe. Jeremy. Yeah, so they're usually probably read in one piece, but what else? What about patterns of reads and writes? What would I expect, Jen? Yeah, they're not written very often, right? Configuration files are not changed that frequently, right? So, so that's, it's potentially a very, very read-heavy workload, right? Let's think about a different type of file in terms of an access pattern that the uh, OS could use uh, could use its knowledge to to optimize, right? Give me another example, Wesley. Like any programming language file, like C file, it gets loaded in the L format, so you know what those were calculated ahead of time. Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. That's possible, but I'm thinking about something quite specific, although fairly common. What's something that a lot of you guys do on a daily basis with your computers? Not in this class, but yeah, and what about MP3 files? How are MP3 files accessed? What's the canonical way of accessing an MP3 file? Your iTunes loads up an MP3 file, and what does it do? Spencer. It reads it from start to finish, in order, right? I mean, unless you're like madly seeking around in the file, in which case it does, but th that's not the normal use for MP3 files, right? The normal use for MP3 files and movie files and many other kind of media files is they're played from the beginning to the end, right, at a fairly consistent rate, right? And this is a case where the, the OS might be able to do some performance caching, right? Because if it knows, if it sees that there's this pattern established within a file, particularly if it, if it might know that the file is a media file, it might start you know, when you issue a request for a certain part of the file, it might go out and just start fetching more parts of the file ahead of it because it knows those parts are about to be used, right? So that's, that's an example, right? Um, and we talked, so, so moving up the stack a few bits, we talked a little bit about how network file systems sometimes don't, don't even, some old network file systems don't support these relationships at all with open and close because open and close when you have unreliable clients starts to become a little bit problematic, right? All right, any questions about this before we go on? Great, yeah. Well, remember, so, so this is a good question, right? So uh, let's go back to the ELF example because this will give us a little memory management review, right? So what does the operating system not do when the program starts? The ELF file describes, has to describe all of the contents of that program's address space, right? Except for things that are initialized to zero like the stack and the heap, but all the code in particular uh, that's part of that program, and of course, yes, it doesn't include dynamically loaded libraries, et cetera, et cetera, but the point is that all the code and libraries used by that program have to be on disk somewhere, right? There has to be a file, whether it's part of the executable for that program or part of a shared li library somewhere, it has to be on disk somewhere, but what does the operating system not do when the file, when, when, sorry, when the program is run? Robert. What's that? Well, it probably needs to open the ELF file and do a little bit of work, right? But what does it not do in particular? Write to it? Okay, it won't, yeah, yeah probably won't write to it, but, but in terms of accessing the file itself, I'm ignoring you, Jeremy. Uh, Andrew. No, so, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying like the process says here's my ELF format, it's got all this code in it that I think I might want to use. But what does the operating system not do when the process is loaded? Remember, there was a specific 
trick that we play here to avoid doing things we might not have to do. Alyssa, do you remember what it is? It doesn't load everything, right? In fact, it probably doesn't load much at all. It waits for the process to, to fault on pages that are missing from its address space, and then when that happens, it goes out and gets them from the file and brings them into memory, right? So if, so going back to your, your example, if the operating system was actually going to load all of the contents, of the ELF file into the address space, right? Then I would see it go, I mean, start to finish potentially all the way through the file loading everything, right? But because I don't do that, right, the pattern of access to ELF binaries is a little bit different, right? And in fact, it probably ends up looking kind of random, right? Because it depends on the, the, the pages in the address space of the, that the process needs, right? All right, so that's a good example. Though. Any other questions on files? Yeah, it's called on-demand paging, right? Yeah, we talked about this when we talked about virtual memory. It's a good reminder. So on-demand paging, it means that if, if, you, if you tell me that you need a page, I will not get it for you until it's demanded, right? And, and code pages, what it means is that that code page will stay in the ELF binary until you need it, right? And then I'll go get it for you, right? When it comes to things like stack and heap, it means that I am not going to find you a page in memory for that big section of heap that you just asked me to allocate until you fault on the page. Then I'll go find you one. Yeah, sure. Well, when you're not reading sequentially, it's a right? Yeah, so you can, right, so you're, you can use LSEQ to move the file pointer around, right? The Unix file system interface allows you to, what's that? Can it move backwards with LSEQ? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, LSEQ can adjust the file pointer in an arbitrary way. Um, so, so let me ask you another question. So why do we, why does the operating system, you know, why does the, we start talking about file systems, we talk about performance. Why do we care, why do we worry so much about performance and file systems, especially when it comes to things like read ahead and stuff like that? I mean, why would we, why does the file, why are file systems designed to try to, to, to why would we try to predict anything about access to files, right? Why does it matter? Yeah, because the disks are really slow, right? And the more information you can give disks about the upcoming requests, the better disk schedulers can, can do, right? So for example, if I could predict all of, so, so think about spinning disks, right? You've got heads on them, and the heads are sitting there, as we saw, and they're bouncing all over the place, all over the disk, right? And moving the heads back and forth creates a great deal of latency. So the best thing I could do is if I knew all the disk access for the next five minutes, right, which I don't, Clearly, but if I did, I could tell the disk about them all at once, right? And if the disk knew about all the blocks that it needed to, to get over the next five minutes, what would the heads look like? What would the heads do? Dan? Yeah, well, okay, but what would the disk do? I, I, I give the disk this like massive list of blocks that it needs to get, right? The disk knows where every one of those are, right? So how does it how does it optimize access to 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 the disk, right? What what would the what would the heads look like? Remember that video we saw of the heads flopping around all over the place, right? But if I told the disk every all like a million different blocks I need I need retrieved, right? How how do you think the disk would schedule those? Look. Yeah, so the disk sorts that entire list from you know, one edge of the disk to the other, right? And then what you would see is that the disk heads would just you know, make one pass across the surface of the disk, right? And along the way, they would pick up everything that they needed from any track they were on, right? But they certainly wouldn't be doing this, right? Because bouncing the heads around like that wastes a lot of time and, and, and increases latency, right? So the more I can tell the disk, the more it can schedule its heads so that it picks up everything in one nice pass, right? We'll talk about this more when we talk about FFS, but it's, it's, it's important to keep in mind, right? Because a lot of the file system optimizations we talk about are really rooted in these properties of spinning disks. Yeah. Will all the data be on the same sector or cylinder? No, no, the data could be all over the disk, yeah. right? So just source it all in the idea is the disk, the disk will, the disk scheduling algorithm will essentially try to move, the, the disk tries to move the heads as little as possible, right? So if I can do one pass with the heads, right? So you imagine, the, d the heads are just slowly crawling across the disk in one direction. And along the way, they're just grabbing data, grabbing data, grabbing data, grabbing data, throwing it, throwing it back to the OS. And the platter's right. still spinning. Oh, yeah, the platter's spinning away, right? So the idea is that, that, that my seek times are minimized, right, because I never bounce around. It turns out that Windows, Windows XP had a, a really clever 
uh, optimization that was based on exploiting this technique that, and, and, and doing some prefetching of actual page loads. Right? That I won't talk about here, because I think it was on the exam last year. Um, anyway, uh, so OK. Any other questions about files before we go on? All right, so let's, let's review about our file system design goals, right? So, so given what we understand about files, the, you know, the file system has to do a couple things. So the first of all thing we have to do is we have to do name translation, right? So I'm going to give you a series of characters, right? And you and I are going to agree about some semantics about uh, certain special characters like dividers for paths, right? And what the file system has to do is actually find the blocks on disk that store the data for this file, right? So this is one of the jobs. I want to allow files to, to grow, to shrink, right? Uh, so, and, and this is different than changing the contents within the files, right? Because and changing the contents within the files ends up, you know, making a little bit less of a difference on disk, right? But you can imagine that when a file grows, for example, I may need to find a bunch of new disk blocks to associate with that file, and I may need to make sure that I can still find those disk blocks when that name is translated, right? Um, the same thing with files moving, right? So what I mean by moving is I mean moving their location within the file system, right? So I move a file from one directory to another, right? The contents on disk are the same, right? And hopefully the contents don't have to move, right? But what does have to move is the file system's idea of where this name is. So that's an example of changing the name without changing the contents, right? Um, so we talked a little bit about ways to optimize access to single files, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about specific file systems. And then file systems also do some clever things to try to identify relationships between files and then do things on disk to make sure that those file systems are efficient to access together. Right? So certain, though for example, a group of libraries that's frequently used by one program. Right? If I can detect that, I may uh, consider that when I think about where to put those files on disk, right? And then an, the other, you know, potentially this should be job number one, right? Because if you can't do this, none of this other stuff really matters, right? Is surviving failures. And that means both trying to preserve as much of the content as possible, but also ma making sure that I keep my data structures in a consistent state, right? Because if I don't do this carefully, all the data may be there, but my data structures are corrupted. So I had a, um, when I was in college, I had, I had splurged for this like really big hard drive. It was 20 gigabytes, right? It was like, wow, it was, it was huge, you know? And, and, I, and I had, you know, filled this thing up with, with MP3s, right? I had this great MP3 collection I was really proud of. Um, and then at some point, I think when I was starting to fool around with Linux, I somehow corrupted the file system data structures on this drive. And I was really sad because I had all these MP3s I really liked, and they were, they were gone. So I, I bought this program that allowed you to repair the file system structure. And it ran over the disk for a while. And it, and it was, it was kind of nice, because at the end, it was like, oh, here, here are your files, right? And there were, there were a couple of, it, it was like, well, you know, out of your 1,000 MP3s, I couldn't find 10 of them. Right? And I was like, oh, that's not too bad. You know, like, uh, I, I won't miss those too much. Thank you for the 990 files. Right? Well, then I started listening to the, to the MP3s that it had found. Right? Where do you think those 10 MP3s ended up? In teeny weeny little bits in all of the other MP3s. So you'd be listening to you know, Madonna, and then suddenly like, Britney Spears would be on for like a quarter second. Right? And then you'd be, and, and so, at the end, I just ended up having to throw out everything, right? Because that's terrible. So, so anyway, so this is a case where you know you 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 survive a failure, and and you know yeah, I mean at, at some point it, it was able to repair itself, but the repair was so bad that that it didn't really matter, right? All right, so um, yeah, so the and and the file systems we're going to discuss all all support you know some uh, superset of these features, right? Uh, they all support files. They all support hierarchical namespaces, right? Which is a is a, a, a very very uh, common feature, right? Um, and so, to some degree, the interface to you looks the same, right? So, if I took your computer today and and took it up to my lab and spent an hour, you know, moving all of your data over to a partition with a different file system on it, and then just stuck it in there, you wouldn't notice, right? Because it's still there's still files. They still grow, shrink, or change. They still are organized in a hierarchical namespace, but suddenly I've replaced your NTFS with ext4 or whatever, right? So what, what turns out what's, di what's different is how these things work and how they're implemented, right?
right? So the, the, the overall file system interface and the look and feel of file systems is pretty, is pretty simple, right? So we start to think about how to implement hierarchical file systems, right? What we notice is the following, that if we think about the disk box, right, the, the data that's actually stored on disk, we can divide these into two categories. So some of them store data, and then some of them store other stuff, right? So the data blocks contain file data, right? That's what you would expect. You know, at some point, the file data has to be on disk, right? These index nodes, or what we'll frequently refer to them as is inodes, right? What, what is an inode, right? Or, you know, what, what's a list of other types of stuff that I would need to store on in disk blocks that is not file content. Yeah, Bart. Yeah, so attributes related to files. What else? Yeah. What's that? Metadata. Yeah, other types of metadata. Okay, that's fair. But I'm I'm still missing something pretty important, Spencer. Files names. Okay, file yeah, file names, but what else? Yeah. What blocks? Okay, some, some it, uh, we're, we're, we're sneaking closer to the answer I want, right? So remember, the file system has to do two things, store contents, and then what's the other big goal of the file system? Yeah. What's that? How to access the data. Okay, that answer is vague, but hopefully moving us in the right direction. Anything not data. Anything not data, okay. That is, <laughs> that is strictly <laughs> correct, but not as specific as I want to be. <laughs> um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah. Location, what do we mean by that? Satish. What, what, what does this mean? What am I missing here? Paul. Well, that's also true. <laughs> um, what about, how do I implement directories? Right? Directories aren't. Directo do, are directories a file? Yeah, it turns out on Unix they actually kind of are, right? But um, but they're not. They, you know, we don't think of that about them as a file. You know, you don't think, oh, I'm gonna, you know, take the contents of my OS 161 uh, assignment and store it in, store it into this directory, right? You might put it inside the directory, but you wouldn't store it in the directory, right? So um, so index nodes have to contain and so. As, Everything else, right? So everything people have mentioned, metadata about files, right, of various types, the name of the file, right, because the, the, the name is, is uh, sep we can think of the name as separate from the contents. The name is how we find the contents, but it is not the contents, right? And then all sorts of other information about the file system data structure, right, in terms of, you know, how, in terms of directories, uh, there, there's parts of disk that you use for, for failure recovery and things like this. So anything that's not a file, right? Um, so when we start to think about looking at different file systems, what I want you guys to notice about file systems that are different, right? Because all the file systems we're going to talk about uh, accomplish these goals, right? One of the biggest things that's different about files is, uh, file systems is, first of all, the data structures that they use to solve these problems, right? Particularly, you know, things like name translation, right? Uh, what do they do when files need to, to grow, right? Where do they find those disk blocks? Where do they put files on disk, right? Um, and this, a lot of this comes down to on-disk layout. So again, you think about it, you know, the, if I took, if I did that experiment we were going to do before where I replaced all of your, I moved all of your files onto a different file system, right? The contents of the files are all the same. The disk could even be the same. I could use the same disk, right? What's different about the file systems is where the contents are on disk and what types of information are stored in disk blocks. So if you could see down to the disk level and see what's in the disk blocks, you'd see major changes, right? Despite the fact that the, the file system looks identical to you at a high level, right? So yeah, so data structures are used in sort of on disk layout, right? And crash recovery, right? So how does the, what are the semantics of crash recovery that are supported and how does the file system prepare for it and then, and then recover from it, right? So as we said before, uh, what I'm really doing is maintaining this large and complex data structure. And this is difficult because with any data structure, right, especially you know, one like this where I have a number of different things that I'm trying to, number of different problems I'm trying to solve, number of different things I'm trying to optimize for, um, making changes requires uh, updating a lot of different data structures, right? So let's talk about an example of this. So let's say I want to write data to the end of a file, right? 
I've opened a file. I want to append some data to it. OK. Uh, so what, does the, what, are, what are things that the file system would need to do in order to accomplish this operation? Somebody I haven't picked on today. Tim. Okay, so right, I need to locate the file, right? So I need to locate the contents of the file. What else do I need to do? Jeremy. Yeah, I've got some extra data now, right? So there, I need to locate some extra disk, disk box, right? So I need to find these empty disk box, right? And I, I, I skipped over the locate one, but that's a good one. That should be in here, right? So I certainly need to, f to, to locate some empty disk box, right? And I also need to indicate that they're, that they're, about, that they're in use, right? Because I have some data that I'm about to put in them, right? What else do I need to do? Bethany. Find a way of saying the purpose for the purpose part of the file there's more algorithm. Yeah, so I need to associate these disk blocks with that file, right? Because these disk blocks are now part of the file, right? And I probably need to have some way of, of <coughs> retrieving for a file the sort of ordered list of disk blocks that store its contents, right? So whatever data structure I'm using to associate the blocks with the file has to be updated, right? What else? Greg? You do I so okay, this is a good question. Do I need to reorganize the blocks so they're contiguous? Is this so is this required? Who thinks it's required? Who thinks it might be a good idea if I could? Yeah, so well, when we talk about ext4, we'll actually talk about the fact that ext4 plays some games to try to allocate disk blocks close to the rest of the file, right? But if I can't then too bad, right? They might be way over on the other side of the disk, and then you might see that you know, sort of thing when, when I actually have to read or write from the file. But yeah, in, in, you know, I definitely want to store things close to each other on disk because that minimizes my seed time, right? So that's a, that's a great point. What else do I need to do here? Sarah? Yeah, 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 eventually, yeah. No, it's uh, okay. So you're getting ahead of us, right? Uh, Hui Kiang, what what else do I need to do? Yeah. So if I have meta, remember I was storing the size metadata. Well, that needs to be updated, right? Because the size of the file just changed, right? And and this is kind of this is important for correctness, right? Because you know I might uh, the file system might actually reject writes that are past the end of the file, right? And how do I know where the end of the file is? Well, I probably use this size, right? So this is important to do. And then, and now, as Sarah said, at some point I actually have to send the request to the disk to actually write the contents, right? But think about it. This requires, so, so at some point, what, what do I actually need to do in order to do this? What has to happen? Does this, so does this, does this probably involve a disk operation? What, who, who thinks it probably does? Yeah, I mean, how, where do I store the blocks that are in use? On the disk, right? So here's one, at least one disk operation. What about this one? Does this involve a disk operation? Probably, because where do I store the data structure that associates the blocks with the file? On disk, right? Uh, what about this? Does this involve a disk operation? There's a pattern emerging here, right? <laughs> Are you guys good with patterns? Um, yeah, so right, the, where do I store the size of the file? On disk, right? And then now I have to do this. So there's all these different disk IOs potentially that have to happen in order for this operation to complete, right? And remember when we talked about synchronicity, right? From the perspective of a process and for correctness, all of these things kind of need to look like they happen together despite the fact that they involve a bunch of different operations to the disk, right? Um, and you can also think about, um, okay, I just, I just talked about this. You can also think about what happens at different points here if, if, I, if I fail or if the disk crashes or if the, the power gets cut or whatever, right? So for example, what happens if I complete step one and then a failure happens or, or my, my, my system turns off? Just as an example, yeah. Yeah, so next time I boot the system, my hard drive just looks a little bit smaller, right? And if I don't do something, potentially, those disk blocks will never be freed, right? 
because they're not actually associated with the file, right? They're just marked as in use. So if you've ever run programs to, to check and correct errors on your disk, this is one of the things potentially, depending on the disk, uh, depending on the file system and its format, that they look for, right? They say, are there any kind of orphaned disk blocks, right? Disk blocks that are marked as in use, but actually not associated with the file, right? Because this can happen in certain cases, right? And again, I won't go through each one because I think I do this again later, uh, but you can imagine what happens in various cases if, the, if, the, if things fail, right? Um, all right, so we talked about this a lot, right? All right, and, and, and for the examples I'm going to show you over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to draw these primarily from, from EXD4, right? So I think it's nice to make this make this nice and concrete, right? All right, so, so when we start talking about EXD4, we have to start talking about some specific, specifics of disks. So the sector on disk also refers to the smallest unit that the disk allows to be written, right? And usually this is like 256 bytes, sometimes it's 512 bytes, right? Um, on the other hand, the block is the smallest unit that the file system will actually write to the disk, right? And this is a multiple, normally, of the sector size, right? Um, and so why would file systems, so here's another question, why, why, not, write, why not write in 256 byte, byte chunks, right? Why would I write these larger 4K, 4K blocks, right? The disk allows me to write at a smaller granularity. Why would I write at a larger granularity? Uh, yeah, but also because of contiguous writes, right? Because remember, if I write to locations that are close on the disk, right, I do one seek, right? So every time I write a block, I do one seek, right? I seek to where all the sectors that are associated with that block are located, and then I do, you know, I do a bunch of writes, right? Probably these are all even on the same track, meaning that I don't even have to move the heads at all, right? If I do have to move the heads, it's not far. Right, because they're going to be on, on neighboring tracks, right? Um, so, and, and the other thing is, where have we heard about 4K before? Anyone remember our friend 4K? What, is, what else is 4K, Sarah? It's the page size, right? The, the virtual memory page size. And when we get back to talking about file system caching, we'll talk about why this matters, right? And it turns out that there is a, there's a good reason for a match between the page size and the block size that file systems are actually going to write, right? Because lo and behold, your system uses memory for something else other than just being memory, and that's it uses memory as a cache to make the disk look faster, right? Um, and then on ext4, you actually also have the, the, the concept of an extent, right? And extents are, this goes back to what Greg was pointing out before about trying to find uh, contiguous blocks, right? So. On ext4, what they've said is they said, OK, you know, even, even if I have a small sector size of 256 bytes, even if I take eight of those and turn it, or, or 16 of those and turn it into a block, right, that's still not big enough, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create even bigger chunks of disks that are called extents, right? And the extents are described by a start and end block. And the idea behind an extent is that I associate extents with the file, and the extents hold portions of the file, right? You, so you can think of extents as a big chunk of a file that map down to a contiguous set of disk blocks, right? Jeremy, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, kind of, right? I mean, you could just think of extents as, you know, as a, as a series of contiguous blocks, right? And why, again, why would I want to write data in even bigger chunks to the disk if I can get away with it, right? Jen? Well, I might have a big file, but why do I want to write in bigger chunks? Yeah, for the same reason I wanted to write up here, right? Because contiguous writes are good for disk scheduling, right? And as Jen pointed out, a lot of files are bigger than 4K, right? If I have things like, you know, again, MP3s or movie files or whatever, these can be megabytes, gigabytes. So the more contiguous they are on disk, the better it is for disk performance, right? And extents are essentially a way that file systems like ext4 have started to address that by saying, OK, again, I'm not going to even bother with block by block allocation. I'm going to give big chunks to a file, right? So what's the, so what, so what's the danger here, right? That essentially, what we're talking about here are pieces of an allocation problem, right? 
I'm allocating disk blocks or disk sectors, right? I've organized them into blocks as my smallest allocation unit. And EXT4 has said, I'm even going to use bigger allocation units. I'm going to call them <coughs> extents. What's the trade-off here? As the extent size gets bigger, what do I have more of? Yeah, so I have this internal fragmentation issue, right? I give the file an extent, right? Let's say the extent is, I don't know, 32K or 64K or 128K. You can set the extent size when you format your file system using the XT4, right? If you have a lot of big files, you might want to set the extent size to be very big. However, for small files, right, what will happen is that as soon as you give it an extent, if it doesn't use a big piece of it, then that part of the disk is potentially wasted. Right, so this is our old friend, internal fragmentation. All right. Um, let's see here. So ext4 inodes, so I'm, I'm going to have at least one inode per file, right? Uh, and inodes in ext4 are actually allocated when you format the disk, right? So when you format the disk using ext4, it, it creates a bunch of areas on disk, right? And it turns out that there's several of these, but you could think of it as just being one, right? But when you format a disk using ext4, it creates all the inodes that the disk will ever have, okay? Um, and so you can actually, if, if depending on how you format your disk, you could run out of files on ext4 before you run out of space, right? Because if ext4 runs out of inodes, it will stop allowing you to create new files, right? So on file systems, if you had like a lot of tiny, tiny little files, right? You might tweak your parameters when you formatted your disk to tell ext4 to reserve more space for inodes, right? So each, each inode is 256 bytes, right? And so I can pack 16 of them into a disk block, right? The inode contains the location of file data blocks, Right, and, and as far as the contents are concerned, and we'll talk a little bit about how that location works. Right, um, it includes permissions about the file. Um, it includes these timestamps that we've talked about. Now, again, this is ext4, right? So it includes the creation time, access time, content modification time, attribute modification time, and delete times. Right, this is kind of interesting. Um, and and inodes are named and located by number. Right, so again, numbers are are what we like. OK, so let's start using one of these fun tools, right? So, and you guys can use this on your own machines. This is called uh, debugfs. Um, and what debugfs will do is it'll print out uh, some information about a particular inode or, or a particular disk, right? So let's see here. Uh, this is showing us, uh, so this is, so I've asked it to print out information about inode number two, right? So again, inodes are, are located by number, right? And so what does it mean, right? The disk knows about I know numbers, right? You know about paths. So what does the disk have to do to find file contents? Dan? Yeah, I have to translate the path to an I know number, right? We'll talk about how to do that probably at Friday. Right? <laughs> All right, so what this tells me is that uh, this inode type is a directory, right? And, and as, as I hinted at before, uh, Unix file systems normally store directories as files, just a special kind of file, right, with a very specific format for the contents, right? Um, this is the mode, right? So if people are familiar with Linux, these are permissions, right? Uh, this tells me the user and group. Uh, anybody know who user group zero are? That'd be root. Uh, the size of the file, right? So again, this is a directory. And it turns out that its size is 4K, meaning that it takes up one block, right? Um, let's see here. Here are all my timestamps, right? So the creation time, access time, modify time, and uh, what was that other thing? Sorry. The content modification time, access time, yeah, whatever. Yeah, these are timestamps. <laughs> the, the, the naming is always confusing. The creation time, right? Um, so yeah, you can tell the time that I started setting up the web server for last year's class. That would be Sunday, January 8th, apparently at 4 in the morning, which I don't think is actually true. Uh, I think that might be GMT or something. It was probably like 9 a.m. <laughs> Jeremy. Ooh, who thinks that because there's a fixed number of inodes that they would be stored in an array? I do. Yeah, yeah, they are. And we'll talk about where they are in a second. 
And that makes indexing very, very efficient, right? So finding inodes is quite easy, right? Once I have an inode number, finding the, the contents of that inode on disk is very simple, right? Mapping paths to inode numbers is, is still hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the, why, why do you think I would store this delete time, right? So, so first of all, doesn't, don't these contents get destroyed when, when the file is deleted? So, so remember, do, do the contents of the inode, are the contents of the, so first of all, is the inode ever deallocated? No, right? EXT4 creates a fixed number of inodes when you format the disk, right? And they immediately take up space. So if you've ever, you know, bought, you know, a, a brand new hard drive like I did, 20 gigabytes, you know, huge, and, and then you sit down and you format it, and what do you notice? Immediately the capacity goes down, right? That's, that's because file system data structures take up space on disk, right? So as soon as you format an ext4 file system, depending on how many inodes you allocate, those inodes take up space on disk, and that space is always used by the file system. It will never be yours again. You can never use it for your burgeoning, you know, collection of, of MP3s, right? Um, but so if a file is deleted, right, I would store the delete time. How long, but how long would this delete time be useful? For, so when a file is deleted, I can update the inode and I could say, here's the delete time. When would, when would the inode contents potentially be reinitialized? I don't know what somebody asked and answered a question today. Peg. No, so I've deleted, I've deleted the file, right? Um, and I've, you know, and, and may, maybe I've, I've deallocated the blocks that hold the file content, right? But again, have I deallocated the inode? No, the inode's just sitting there, right? When would I potentially reuse this inode? Yeah. Yeah, if at some point I need a new inode, right? Like I'm creating a new file and I look around and I can't find any other inodes. I'll come back to an inode that I've already used, and at that point, I'd reinitialize it, and I'd, set, I'd probably reset the delete time to be you know, zero or nothing. Right? So the idea is that it, I think these delete times probably persist until the inode is reused. Right? So, but you know, it's, I, don't, I don't know why, actually, uh, ext4 stores the delete time, but it does. All right, so, and then also remember the inode has to allow me to find so I'm going to use a path to find the inode. The inode has to allow me to find the rest of the file, right? So down here, right, uh, what is also stored with the inode is the blocks that correspond to this file, right? Remember, this file is 4K, so how many blocks does it have? One, right? And this gives me the block index of, um, of the one data block in this file. Right? This is a directory that one data block is actually going to be the contents that I'm going to use to map path names to other inodes. Right? And we'll talk more about that on Friday. Right? So um, it turns out, I think, that on ext4 file systems 2, the inode number 2, it used to be 1. I don't know why it got bumped. Right? But the inode number 2 is special. Right? What do you, can anyone guess what's special about inode number 2? It used to be one. Yeah. It's the root of the file system, right? So this is the inode for root, right? It's a directory, right? Doesn't have very many entries in it, so it's only one block. It's owned by root, right? It was created when the system booted, right? So yeah, this is forward slash, right? It's, it's the root of the file system. Um, so as we said before, all inodes are created at format time. Right? So when I format the disk, uh, all these inodes are allocated by ext4, and the consequences are, well, there, there's two consequences, right? So first of all, inodes may not be located near the contents of the file, right? And this is kind of not, not the greatest thing, right? So, uh, one of the, so if I, let's say this, this was my disk and I put all the inodes here, right? Well, what would happen is that you know, a lot of times I'd be seeking back and forth between my inodes and my data blocks, right? And I could potentially have really long seek times. So what ext4 actually does is, and again, this, these are all configurable parameters when you format the disk, it creates multiple inode groups throughout the disk, 
right? So if this was my big, huge, two terabyte hard drive, I wouldn't have all the inodes right here. I'd have a bunch here, I'd have a bunch here, I'd have a bunch here, I'd have a bunch here. And then when I start allocating files, I try to find an inode, and then I try to find data blocks that are close to that inode, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, Jeremy. Say, sorry? No, no, no. That, that I, I think there's, there's, there's some constant in the disk that allows you to, to basically take. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking an index and now I'm mapping it to this distributed array. But I think I can still do that if I know how many, like what the number of things per entry are and, and where they are. Right. I think that's still a, a pretty simple operation. So what Jeremy is saying is it's a little bit more tricky now to map between inode number and find the, the disk block that I need to get that inode, but it's still, it, it's still fairly easy. Right? There's a few more concepts I need to know. Right? Um, so as so I said before, you can run out of inodes before you run out of data blocks. So it's possible that I could not be able to create files on an ext4 system despite the fact that there are data blocks available. Right? By default, ext4 creates one inode per 16k of, of data. Right? What does that mean? What, what assumption is it making here? I, if I create one inode per 16k of data blocks, what do I hope about the files on my system? Well, they're, they're going to be, I'm going to, uh, damn. Yeah, the average size is 16K, right? Who thinks the average size of files on your system is about 16K? Well, they do, right? So, <laughs> so it's, it's a really great question, right? So we talked before, I mean, there are some files that are huge, right? Like probably most files that you guys deal with on a daily basis, whether they're videos, pictures, any sort of media format is definitely going to be bigger than 16K. But remember, what, was, what did Bethany point out before about configuration files? They're tiny, right? So you've got all these teeny weeny little like 1K, 2K, 4K files, right? About 4K, right? That's probably the smallest file size. And, and you have a huge number of them, and then you have probably a, a heavy tail of sort of bigger files, right? You interact with those bigger files more frequently, but that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of small files as well. Yeah, Bethany, do you have a question? Yeah, that's true too, right? And that's one of the reasons that ext4 allows you to change this, right? So servers might have certain types of files. Yeah, so if you were setting up like a video server or something, right, you would probably change this to be quite a bit bigger, right? You would tell ext4, you know, create one inode for like 128k or maybe even a meg, right? What that means is, um, and actually when you, when you format ext4, it'll, it'll do a number of different optimizations based on the average file size, right? It'll also give you bigger extents, right? What it means, however, is that you can have fewer files on your system, right? But there's some number of, there's some amount of space you can recover by not creating a bunch of extra inodes you're never going to use. Yeah, Jerry. Is that part of the reason why you get a Linux installation that uh, they'll, they'll separate the tree the, 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 into multiple file systems? Like, they have one for, like, your whole directory? Or I don't know why that is. That's a, that's a good question. And I don't, I don't know if that's the reason, but I, I'm not sure why. All right, so on Friday, we'll keep talking about on-disk layout, and we'll talk about how we, particularly how we translate file names to inode numbers.